I'm Janda from the Enviro House, um, which is still closed, unfortunately. And Jenny Call is presenting today. Jenny represents Garden Sphere, and I will give you a little more information about her when we introduce. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and um, most of you, I'm sure, have been on a webinar at least once on Zoom this year, but if not, there should be a bar at the bottom of your screen with a QA and a um, little paragraph, um, polls, which we will be presenting, and um, a chat where you can put comments or questions in the chat. Um, I recommend that you use the chat rather than the Q&A because Q&A gets answered live usually and then others don't see it. And when it's in the chat, it's recorded. Yeah. So we have several people signed up for this morning. So um, hopefully we'll get the majority in. Um, the EnviroHouse is expected to open sometime in the spring. I'm still waiting to see what the requirements are going to be and when the city says it's okay to go back. Um, we will, for the beginning part, be continuing webinars virtually and hopefully get back into in-person workshops soon. Um, we do have um, recorded videos. This one is being recorded and all the ones that we've done this year are recorded. So if you haven't seen those, you can find those on the city's YouTube channel. Um, and I, <clears throat> I will put that link in the chat and you can also find on the Enviro House website the recorded ones for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Jenny is um, a teacher, an elementary teacher. She's a farm girl from Fife, grew up on a farm. She's got her own little farm out in Midland area, I think. Um, so she's well experienced with all of the things that we've talked about in the past and we, that we deal with as far as fruit trees and mason bees and gardening. And she's done a lot of webinars for us and also our how-to videos we've done. Uh, those are also on the city's YouTube channel. So um, I'm going to let Jenny tell you a little more about herself and then um, we will get ready to get started. Yeah, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, like Janda said, um, I am representing Garden Sphere. We're located in uh, North Proctor. Um, they're like a little family. Travis and Gabe own Garden Sphere, but everybody there um, um, is fantastic. Uh, Joseph and Audra and, and everybody there is super helpful. Um, and I love working there. Um, I grew up in the Puyallup Valley on the Fife side when Fife was all farms. And so uh, the smell of rotting cabbage this time of year is like home to me. So <laughs> uh, kind of a funny thing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a school teacher as well. I teach third grade and um, I've been doing this my whole life. So I have a degree in sustainable agriculture and I have my own um, small farm um, that I run as well while I am I'm teaching in the classroom. So um, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about mason bees, our little flying insect friends. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through this webinar, uh, please type them into the chat. Um, we'll try to get to them as quickly as we can. Um, I, you know, we're all teachers and learners here, and so we, we value your your input as well. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. All right, and a little slideshow here. All right, so um, and then Janda, you know, I know uh, Janda like it will pop in and and I will monitor questions. Um, and I'm trying to see why my pool is not coming up. It's not showing where to launch it here. So we will hopefully be able to get that to work. If not, we'll do it in the chat. So sounds uh, like a plan. <laughs> okay. So all right. So we've got our take yeah. off. Yeah. Okay. okay. We've got our blue orchard mason bees. This is a close up picture of our little insect friend. Um, you'll see that it has like this iridescent color to it. So it will look really similar in the um, very early spring. 
it'll look like a fly um because some of the you know some of the big black flies they have kind of like this iridescent color to them and they're darker right they're not they're not going to have like that yellow that we see with the honeybees or with some of our bumbles um so they're they're a little bit different coloring so if you see uh something that looks kind of like a fly running around in uh, march april um gets into the house um try to shoo it out <laughs> instead of being like ah fly uh, because little black you know these little blue orchard mason bees um they really do look very very similar um and they're quite tiny um and they they won't hurt you but i love this picture because it is such a nice close-up and you can see its iridescence um that green and that blue the aqua color and um, you can see how similar it looks to a, a, a black fly. So um, they're little friendly little insects. Um, here we go. So we have some really great reasons to, to house mason bees. Um, mason bees help with all of our crops right so our fruit and berries crops um they also will will get in there if you have any early squash um or early flowering um through june uh, any of those uh fruits that that do flower through june or if you have a greenhouse and you open it up and you let insects kind of fly in and you've got those early tomatoes maybe you're really early on that and you've got a beautiful greenhouse um but they are going to be the first ones that come out our plums tend to be one of our first flowering fruits and especially those um those those juicy little yellow ones and and red ones um and and the mason bees are really uh, our first pollinators out so um they are they are the the manpower behind those plums um they are part of our natural native ecosystem as well so so you know they are they're helping support that ecosystem and they're helping with encouraging and keeping that diversity of pollinators we have in our natural native um, native areas. They are really, really great pollinators. Um, they're super fun to watch. Um, so so they have they'll you will you'll learn about what they what they live in if you if you are unsure. Um, but you can see them going in and out of their little little hidey holes uh, to lay eggs and things like that. They're, they're really neat to watch um, because they have this habit. Um, and it, it's neat when you see them uh, carrying a little bit of mud, you know, when they've finished it, uh, finished laying and they, they, they put some mud in there and they, they've got a little bit on their feet and, they, you know, they bring it up. So they are, they're, they're really interesting little creatures, little insects. Um, they are super docile, so they're not going to sting you. Um, the, the males cannot sting at all, um, and they they're they're solitary, so they're just like, hey, I'm out there, I'm 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 doing my thing, and um, they kind of ignore the rest of the world. So so they're they're not aggressive at all. Very very not aggressive. So here are some of those wonderful reasons that we love mason bees um you can see we've got some blueberries and raspberries uh, strawberries got a little little elderberry in there and apples you know so all of those are 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 things that we we enjoy we love to eat and mason bees are a part of that that system here's our our first poll question what is your experience in hosting mason bees so um, I've never had a mason bee house before. Um, I have or had one, but I didn't see any bees. Um, I've had mason bee houses, but had a lot of pest problems. Um, we'll talk about different pests for the mason bees. Um, I've had mason bees uh, houses, but I need a little help with the setup or anything else uh, apart in your experience. Um, go ahead and put that that in the chat for us that would be awesome all right never had them okay never had a mason bee house well i'm glad you're here if you've never had them welcome to the world of mason bees <laughs> There, it's a, it's really neat. It's it's pretty cool and very low maintenance. So, I love it. 
Yeah, I, you know, seeing them around that well, because they're one of our native pollinators, you know, um, a fence posts, um, little hole, uh, the right size hole in, in old rotting trees and things. I mean, the the flickers and our uh, plated uh, woodpeckers, they make like the best holes for mason bees. So they're kind of, you know, working together there. With, you'll see them around. Cool. No bees. All right. Very little activity. Never had them. All right. This is great. Yeah, I totally will. We will talk about prepping for winter. Absolutely. We will absolutely talk about that. Fantastic. Yeah, so this is good. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. And then, um, Janda, were you able to get that poll up? Wasn't sure. <laughs> I cannot get it up and I don't know why I'm going to have to call Zoom. That's okay. That's all right. We've got some good, we've got some good stuff here in the chat, you know, um, you know, kind of a smattering. Um, several people haven't had Mason bees before, so this is really cool and some wintering over and, you know, talk, we'll talk a little bit about why maybe you don't have any activity. So, so this is great. This is good stuff. All right. So your Mason bees, where are they gonna live? Where are they gonna hang out? So our mason bees, um, they're gonna live in round openings that are roughly a quarter inch to three eighths in diameter. And they're gonna live in a circular tube um, even if it's drilled in, um, they're going to live in a circular tube or circular circular opening. Um, that's about six inches deep ish, six to eight inches deep. Um, and they are, there are lots of different housings. So, um, there are wood blocks that separate and I'll show you folk pictures of that. And so when they separate, they kind of look like half, half um circular uh cylinders little half cylinders and when you put them together then you've got the six inch cylinder um it's, it's a correct diameter um and they're really really easy to clean um the the picture we have here is of a, a housing of a teardrop housing um and you'll notice if you look really really closely um there is an opening right here that little opening is is fantastic you can take you can take that and and put the um cocoons right into there um, when you get them brand new or if maybe you're you're adding some maybe you didn't get enough um, mason bee ac action happening and so you put them in there and then they can fly out of that opening and start their journey um, in the spring um, right here these are reeds cylindrical reeds um, and they serve the same purpose as your um, cylindrical tubes so there are paper tubes and cardboard housings for those tubes that work beautifully and so with this you would have you would fill it up now you don't have to fill it entirely to the brim okay you know if you just want to fill it up halfway, fill it up halfway, see what happens, see how many um, get mudded over. And we'll talk about mudding over, um, see how many you get at the end of the season and maybe they're all full. So you're like, okay, I've got to add more cylindrical tubes to my housing. And so um, this is a really great example because it has this overhang and you can see it's about a two inch overhang. And when you have a, um, a mason bee house, you want an overhang of about two to three inches. And what that does is it protects it from the weather. Um, it kind of gives it a little, a little, a little protection from, from other birds and flying, flying critters. Uh, Cause it, it, it covers it up, kind of hides it away a little bit, um, but it really protects those cylindrical um, housing you know, tubes for them. And so this is a really great example of, of a mason bee house or the living quarters <laughs> for your mason bees. Um, you'll also notice that is it's mounted. It's mounted right to the side of the house there. Um, you are gonna wanna make sure that they're facing eastward. Okay, so the best you can, right? You know, if, if you have nothing that faces east 
you know, just do your very best, you know, maybe Northeast, Southeast, um, Northeast might be a little bit better just because it won't get the hot, hot sun, um, in this, in the late summer when they're, when that larvae is developing, um, and, uh, won't get super hot for them, but, um, as best eastward as you can. Um, but again, this is an excellent example of a Mason bee house. This is a great, great example. I'm gonna kind of move that over there. All right, here are some other examples. I think I'll just close that. There we go. Here's some other examples of Mason bee houses that are that work fairly well. And then we have a non-example as well. Um, I want you to kind of think in your head, which one of these would be the non-example? <laughs> um, there is a feature of our non-example that is really great. And then there is a feature of our non-example, which makes it our non-example. Um, see if you can guess which one it is. This is a great housing unit right here. Okay, it is incorporating the block, the wood block that separates, which is inside and you can see it's a half block and you can buy them as half blocks or whole blocks. And you can see that when you look at that whole block, it, it is, it's just bound together by a rubber band. Now you can bind it together, you know, maybe a zip tie that's easily to, easy to cut off, rubber band, a thick rubber band, anything to kind of keep those together and secure is what you need, um, it, it, you know, whatever you have that's gonna keep it together and keep those cylindrical whole um, housing, housing areas uh, nice and tight for those mason bees. But you can see that a half block is used in here. Um, the half blocks, these blocks are fantastic for several reasons. Um, they're very easy to clean. You can take them apart. You can take out your cocoons and, um, kind of check them at the end of the season. So now would be, you know, November is an excellent time, November, December to kind of take your houses down and, and check those out. Um, but they come apart, right? So you can clean them and sanitize them really, really well. So say you had um, a couple of, of pest issues, and we'll talk a lot about pests. You can take it apart, give it a really good cleaning and have it fresh for that next spring, okay? This also sets it back about an inch, inch and a half, but then it also has that overhang. So it, it kind of has a, a dual overhang, you know, double protected there. And we really like that overhang to, um, you know, for protection from weather, from, from hot sun if it is in an area that is a little bit south facing. This tube here is great. I have a tube like this. The um, Enviro House also has a tube up here. And um, they're hung in up towards the eaves, okay? And what's great about these Mason B tubes is A, it's, uh, it's just PVC and it's got the cap with two drilled holes. So uh, the cap at the end, um, you drill it directly to the side of your home or side of the area where you're having uh, your, your, you've cited that's a great eastward facing spot for your Mason B house. And, and then you can just pop this right in and pop it right back out. So it's easy to clean, easy to move, easy to adjust. Um, and this is a great example of the cardboard tubes. Okay, here is a great example of those cardboard tubes. It gives ample overhang. Um, and I really, I, I really like those opposed to the wood, um, but both work fantastic. All right, bamboo tubes found that four of them are plugged with mud last spring and have not opened up. Um, last spring, okay, they done by mason bees or wasps. How would I know if it is done by mason bees or wasps? Okay, we will absolutely talk about that. That's a good one. That's a great question. Um, yeah, that is a great question. So we'll 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 give that a um, hit as we get closer to talking about kind of how they how they close up their spaces. Mud is a good sign, though. I have to tell you. Um, so um, the block. Now, as long as this wood block is under an overhang, right? Because um, we have the correctly sized holes. They are together nice and tight, so they're not going to slip apart. You could build just a ledge on that and set the block on top of the ledge close 
to your eaves, okay? Um, because then you do have that overhang. However, you are gonna have to watch for slippage. So in your ledge, you might wanna build in um, just, just a little bit of a, a, some height on the edges so it can set inside so it doesn't slide or move. Um, I have seen that done as well. So um, that as long as it's close to the eaves and close to an overhang and to have that protection, um, you, you'll be all right. But a lot of times what you'll find is people will break apart these big blocks and they'll have them out or they'll maybe they'll break them up into three parts and they'll put them into separate housing units um and then they'll put them in uh, right under their eaves or put them in a protected space um so there's there's a lot of versatility with these uh with the wood block that separates into sections there's a lot of versatility in that um what you'll notice here as well with this cylindrical PVC tube is that these are the cardboard housings. Um, what you'll find is that there are inserts, there are paper inserts you can buy and those can go right inside. So those cardboard housings last about two to three seasons. And if you put the paper, they kind of look like little paper straws, um, little, if you put those paper, um, uh, casings inside those cardboard tubes, um, it is the correct diameter and you can pull them out and protect them while um, still reusing that, that cardboard housing as that extra layer of protection. Our non-example is the middle Mason Bee house. Now the overhang on this is beautiful, okay? It's a really nice overhang. It, it is really protecting it, but what you'll notice, it's not quite deep enough, is it? It's not deep enough. That needs to be another about two to three inches in depth, okay? So it, it may be useful for another insect, say if the holes were drilled at a different size, um, another pollinator, but not for a mason bee. It's it, that this house will be really hard to clean, um, hard for them to lay appropriately um, because they really do need that depth. They're gonna lay a lot of eggs in there and there'll be a lot of larvae growing and things like that. So there's not enough space. There's just not enough space. So this is our non-example with the exception of this beautiful overhang, <laughs> um, which is a nice, it's a nice overhang. Now, things to avoid, things to avoid. Um, the drilled wood, again, if I pop back, if I pop back, these are drilled into a wood solid block, okay? Try to avoid it. Try to avoid buying those uh, because what's gonna happen is it's gonna be very difficult to clean. Um, you're gonna have to re-drill those holes every year to make sure that they're cleaned out um, and then, if it gets out of whack, if they get too big, mason bees won't lie in there. They just won't. And so um, they become difficult, difficult to use. Um, I know that they're, you know, common to see. Um, but if you can get the wood blocks that, that can separate, your bees will be healthier and you'll have a much easier time cleaning them. Um, using, if you can use those paper liners, even in the wood uh, blocks that you can separate, even in those wood blocks, if you can use um, um, use liners, um, it can cause some issues because of the diameter. Um, so the liners in, in those wood blocks, um, you kind of want to avoid that. Um, but again, in the cardboard tubes, liners are that they're actually built you can buy them with the cardboard with with the liners in them um so there's some some spots you um want to avoid with those liners um leaning upward so if you look at this house here um you can see that it's tilted up that's asking for trouble because water is just going to get in there and it's going to end up rotting that whole system and killing the larvae inside which will be super sad um our our non-example shows the shallow depth, okay? That was only about three inches. And so you really need to find um, housing units at, that allow for six to eight inches. And then you want that overhang to be two to three inches, okay? Um, do not mount them in full sun, right? Uh, it will make that larvae, the larvae will struggle and have the potential of a lot of die off in, in late summer um, when they're developing late summer into, into September. 
early fall. Um, and they have to be protected. So really, truly, this, this image is a beautiful image because A, it shows the variance in the diameter here. Um, this is so much different than this. Those are for other pollinators. They're, the mason bees are not gonna go to those. Um, you can see um, they're, they're covered by other things. It's lifted up, so water is getting in there. It's gonna be damaged. There is no overhang, okay, to protect that house. Um, and that's super unprotected. It, you, you won't have mason bees there. They're gonna, they're gonna not want to hang out in your house. Um, and so these are some things to avoid. Um, here is our second poll. I have, I do have this one. Okay, so, perfect. So what kind of mason bee house do you have or do you want to buy or build? Because you can build these too. Um, the PVC tube, the wood block with the drilled holes, um, open house with the tubes, um, the wood block house that separates. Um, not quite sure, you don't know quite enough or if you have something other in the chat. And we'll pop that chat up. Um, I, you know, it's always interesting to find out if people have Mason Bee houses already and they just haven't used them. So um, I know that uh, we do have a panelist, uh, uh, someone with us right now that who, who they have a couple of houses and they have little activity. A few of you have, have, um, have homes, so. Okay, so we have almost everybody answered. I'll give it about another second. And then um, I will share. Excellent. I'll go ahead and try to answer this, this question we have here in the q and A. It says, um, I've put up some bamboo tubes, found that four of them are plugged with mud. That's a mason bee. <laughs> um, and um, you, you don't have to necessarily open them up, but the mason bees are, are the ones that are going to plug that up with mud. Yeah, they're, they're going to plug that right up with mud. Um, wasps are a little bit different. Um, they require, depending on the type of wasp, it requires a different diameter hole or housing, cylindrical housing um, for a wasp. So, um, it's most likely if it's in a mason bee tube, then and it's the uh, correct diameter, then that mason it is going to be a mason bee in there. Okay, well take care, take care. We uh, you can always go back to the video later. Um, have piece, uh, paper tubes. Can I put them in some other container not made of petrochemicals? Uh, like I said, uh, we've got lots of choices here. So um, as long as you have the, the paper tubes, right, um, you can put them in any kind of housing. Um, I, I had that example of that nice wood teardrop on um, housing, um, you, anything that's square. We've got a square house. I'll go ahead and go back to those pictures because uh, I know that can be very helpful. So Jenny, are you seeing the shared screen? Uh, the, the poll, no, no. Okay, because I shared it. Okay. Um, we had um, two folks that have have or would like to have the PVC tube house. Um, one had answered wood block with drill holes. Uh, open house with tubes. Um, we have four Great. and wood block house that separates we have five and don't know enough about it to answer yet we have five okay well that's good that's that's a good that's a good mix um so to, uh to answer that question as you can see yeah, this is just a wood housing um with the tubes in there um and then we have that this housing here this could be filled with tubes not just that wood block um so so as long as you've got that housing a secure housing with that overhang um any of those will work right and that they do you know they're not you know the natural wood um avoiding um the pvc so um That'll, that, I hope that answers your question. Um, <laughs> any kind of housing will work as long as you've got that, that overhang and you can hang it up, um, you know, hang it up on that where, you know, that flat surface wherever you're hanging it. Um, started drilling a wood block, but never finished it, left it in the potting shed and all the holes got filled. Oh, how funny. Okay, so <laughs> 
that happens all of the time. Uh, you know, these, they, they, those little native mason bees, they will, they will come and they will find those holes. So um, now what you're going to do is you're going to put them in a protected space. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, there's our pool. So um, we're going to talk about how to how to protect them. Okay, so uh, so when you're starting out and you're seeding your house, so um, those little cocoons are the mason bee seed. Um, uh, you are going to want to seed your house. Okay, and um, there's several nurseries that have the seed available um, in February. And in March, uh, you can start purchasing the seed. Um, Garden Sphere, we always have it. Um, and we actually source our mason bee uh, cocoons and the seed. We, we source them locally. Okay, so they are from here. They are from here in Pierce County. So they are Pierce County mason bees, um, which is fantastic and supporting another small business. You're going to buy them January to April. April really is uh, uh, the late later end and you may have a difficult time finding them in April. So think like January is very, very early because you're not gonna place them outside quite yet, but you can prepare them, right? And keep them um, in a cool space. Um, February, March, kind of the sweet spot. Okay, that's kind of the sweet spot to purchase mason bees and they are gonna be readily available um, in February and in March. So, um, so that's, a, that's kind of the sweet spot is February, March. Um, you can collect them from someone who has already been successful with mason bees. Say you have a really good friend, they've done mason bees, they've, um, they've got their seed, um, and you can, you can get them from other folks um, who have them. It's always cool to share, right? Because they're native bees, they're going to love it here anyway. They're going to thrive, right? And, and if they will go look for a place, you know, that that's right for them. So um, just know that you know, you can, you can get them from friends as well. You don't have to, you know, buy them um, per se. Um, but, uh, you know, at Gardens here, we always, we always do carry them. Um, and we do um, get them locally here in Pierce County. Uh, you are going to put one cocoon, one little seed into one of your tubes or holes. Okay. And you're just going to gently put it in there. You know, don't or shove it all the way in, um, but you're just going to kind of gently you know, put it in there um, and you're just going to seed all of the places or just if, if you have a lot of um, openings, um, just take your little box of seed and put them put them in there. Um, you don't necessarily have to feed, seed all of them. OK, but but put all your seed out um, into your your holes, your openings. OK, um, you're going to put the box if you don't feel comfortable handling your cocoons um, because they are quite delicate um if you don't feel comfortable hand handling them um you're just going to place the box that they come in um you're going to take the tape off there's normally a little hole and a little bit of tape and you take that tape off and you just set the box right in your your housing okay and and make sure that hole is facing out okay and please do make sure you have tubes or other holes available, um, but you can just set that box right in there if you don't feel comfortable how, uh, handling the seed in the cocoons. Um, Cause I know some, that might give some anxiety uh, there. So you don't have to handle them to, to prepare your house. Um, the females are a little bit larger than the males. So you're always gonna have, uh, you're gonna have females and males. If you do purchase them, you're gonna have uh, both in there. Okay, so you'll, you'll be, guaranteed to have both. Here's the timeline. So this should answer some questions about what to do, um, you know, uh, once they're seeded and, and they're mudded over and, and all of that. This is a great timeline. Um, um, and I do suggest, you know, if you can, you can print it off or save it because um, it'll kind of give you the to do's for the month. Right. So um, January, we'll start. I always like to start the first first to the last <laughs> or sequentially, right? So in January, uh, the mason bees are in a nice, cool, dry place. Um, if you have an established mason bee house, um, they're gonna just, you can keep them all in there. All the tubes that have been established, they're all mudded over. You're just gonna keep them in a nice, dry, cool spot. Um, you've taken them off of the house. Um, if you need to, um, 
get yourself started with Mason Bees. January is a great time to kind of prepare, right? Um, you know, figuring out the housing, you know, do you need to purchase uh, the tubes? Do you need to purchase a housing unit? Do you need to purchase the wood blocks? Um, what do you need? Kind of get that prepared and then figure out kind of where you're going to purchase your cocoons, your seed, uh, Mason Bee seed, because you can call and ask and say, hey, when do you get them in? Um, and uh, kind of prepare yourself for that. Um, so January is kind of a prep prep month if you haven't done it before and they're just hanging out in your nice dry cool spot um, if you've done it before. In February, kind of towards the end of the month, you can start putting your houses together, hanging them outside and putting them in place, the houses, okay. Um, end of February, the once we get temperatures that are above 50 degrees, 50 to 55 is kind of that emergent temp where we get consistent temperatures, okay? Those mason bees are gonna to wanna to start emerging, okay? Please, please, please pay attention to what's flowering. If you don't have anything flowering in your neighborhood at the end of the month in February, don't put your seed out quite yet, okay? Um, you know, we have to watch the weather. So if we've had a really, really rough winter and our winter is carrying in and our temperatures aren't going consistently above 50 degrees every single day, um, keep, those, keep those mason bees in, okay? Your house can be out, you can get your house all prepped, but keep that seed, keep those cocoons in that nice dry, cool space um, until we get those consistent 50, 50 degrees or higher temps outside. Um, because what will happen is if we sometimes we get those blips of temperature where we're like, woo, it's 65, 70 degrees out, and then we're back to 48. Um, what can happen is that the bees can be stunned um, and um, there can be a lot of health issues uh, with the bees themselves um, and I saw a little bit of die off happening if it, if it gets really hot and they all emerge and then it gets really, really cold, um, there they, you'll have a little bit of die off happening. So pay attention to the temps. Um, end of February is kind of where we start itching above 50 degrees. We get 50 degrees, we keep getting more consistent. So it tends to be a good time to put those uh, cocoons in the seed out. At this time too, if you've had mason bees before, this is a time to kind of do some clean out, right? Um, in February, not necessarily at the end of the month, but you know, at the beginning of February, you're gonna wanna start replacing tubes. You're gonna wanna clean it out. Um, you know, get, get that all cleaned out um, and ready to put your cocoons that you've kept nice and cool and dry, put them in a nice clean space. Um, if you have just kept everything all together, which is totally okay, um, you're going to want to wait for all of those mason bees to emerge before you replace tubes and clean out. Okay. So wait till they're all open and everybody's left to go do some mating. Okay, and mating normally does begin at the end of February, beginning of March. Now, March through June is it's mating. There's a lot of pollination happening, egg laying. You're going to see mud on those tubes. Now, they're going to seal. They're going to go 30 to 35 chambers can be sealed um, with the females laid um, um, towards the back of the tubes there. So um, the, you're, you're going to see a lot of activity March through June. And because you've been so proactive and you've got a clean space, they're in eastward facing, they've got this beautiful overhang when we get those spring rains. Okay, you're going to see so much happening. Okay, if you see mud, that is awesome. That's a good thing. You want to see that mud. In July, everything should start to be mudded over, okay? Everything, they're kind of done. Mason bees are our early pollinators. And so by July, they are done pollinating. That's when the other pollinators that we have here, our other native pollinators are kicking up into high gear, okay? So the, everything should be mudded over, egg development begins. This is where everything's starting, right? And this is why we really wanna make sure that we're not putting our house or our housing unit in a south facing space because it'll get too hot and you will have die off, okay? 
So egg development, this is really cool, right? They're, they're growing, they're, they're moving, they're shaking in there. Um, if you would like, you can put a very light screen over your house or over the opening to protect it from wasps, from flickers, woodpeckers, um, squirrels, um, anything that's gonna wanna go in there and start eating the eggs and the larvae. Uh, because that is a tasty treat and uh, flickers especially will want to get in there and be like hey this is awesome free food um, and so <laughs> putting a little light screen over that opening or over um, over the house itself um, mesh some something to just to kind of give it uh, give it a little cover uh, to help protect it is always helpful um, we've had to do that a couple of times that we have a lot of flickers here and uh, the flickers really think it's great uh, when the when it's not covered because they're like free food. Love that protein. <laughs> so um, August to November, we've got tons of development happening. That larvae is kicking. I mean, it is it's growing, it's developing, it's doing its thing. Um, it's it's pretty cool. So you've got a lot of action happening in the tubes. July through November. The heat dome can, how can I tell if the cocoons are still viable? This is, that's a really good question. And we will get back to that if for November, December. That's wonderful. Uh, Mason B houses. Oh, yep. There we go. Yep. That's great. Yeah, Janda, that's, that's good information right there. Uh, might be why I had some paper tubes that were half pulled out. Yes. Um, those, those birds, let me tell you, those flickers, they think that's the best ever. So if you see tubes that are kind of pulled out from the rest of them, it's because somebody squirrel or some other critter has decided, hmm, snack. Um, so November, December, this will answer your question about checking the viability. So um, November to December, this is when you're going to start taking your houses if you choose to, um, not everybody chooses to. I like my folks, uh, a lot of times they'll leave them up um, through the winter. Um, but if you wanna have a little bit more control over um, seeing what's going on with your cocoons, um, seeing if you have to reseed, viability, things like that, um, you're gonna wanna take those houses down. Um, you know, this is a great time if you've used um, the cardboard tubes and the paper inserts, um, paper liners, taking those out okay you can very gently unwrap them i've got a good picture of that in the next slide um you can gently unwrap them and you can tell how your cocoons are doing okay there there are i'll show you some really great um uh pictures here of of uh, viable and not viable um and, and this is the time to kind of harvest your cocoons, put them in a nice, safe, cool, dry space um, where they won't be disturbed until you put them out and, and fill your homes again. Um, you don't have to unwrap them. You don't have to disturb the tubes at all, but, but taking them out of that cold, wet, damp area outside and putting them in a nice, dry, cool space where they won't be disturbed is a good idea because as you can tell, I mean, our our fall has been exceptionally wet, right? And moisture can, all of this moisture can damage um, the, the cocoons. It can, it can cause some, some um, issues with mites and whatnot. And so um, taking them down and putting them in a nice cool dry place is, is will help your mason bees a lot. We're full of puncture holes, wasps, wasps, yeah. That was wasps. Yeah. A, a lot of times you'll see that and they will, um, they'll eat. Um, I guess it depends on the, the size of the puncture hole. There's a couple of uh, insects uh, that will come in and will rob the mason bee um, larvae. And so um, depending on the size of the hole, um, the larvae have been, they've been robbed. Okay. Um, and so that, that's kind of sad. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, here are some of our fun little pests. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, there are lots of others, um, but you know the birds. Birds are a huge one. Um, uh, wasps will get in there um, and and eat that larvae. They are they are hungry, especially in in early fall. Um, squirrels, squirrels, squirrels like to get into anything. So um, they're they're funny little creatures. Um, I haven't had a lot of squirrel 
issues just because we have the placement of where we've put our mason bee houses. Um, flickers, absolutely, and woodpeckers. Um, I have a lot of a lot of flickers. I do have some some woodpeckers. Um, crows, if they're crafty enough, crows if they've figured out where it is, they'll go for it, right? But crows have a lot of things they can get into, and we know how smart they are. Um, that they'll they'll go for something easier. Mason bees are a little bit harder, a little bit trickier. Okay, this is this is chalk brood right here. Okay, chalk brood is a fungal infection. Um, chalk brood, it's really quite sad. Chalk brood basically turns them into little mummies. Um, the fungus gets in there and um, they, they really do. They turn into little mason bee mummies. Um, it's quite sad. Um, so we've got some chalk brood here happening. Um, you can tell the larvae is, it has a deceased. Um, this is not what a cocoon should look like. Okay, you can tell that it'd been mummified pretty early on in the larval stage. So chalk brood is one of the things you do want to look for. You can tell this is a reed. Uh, it's a reed or a wood, um, wood housing, cylindrical housing here. Maybe wood doesn't look very reedy, does it? Um, it's a wood, um, wood. This one's more reed like paper. Paper, I love the paper housings just because and the inserts with that cardboard housing because you can open them up and really investigate. But chalk brood is one of those things you really do have to look for. Now, the hairy footed mites, our little pollen mites, you can see, are having a great time right there. there those pollen mites are like, woohoo! And they will completely encapsulate the um, the larvae and that cocoon and um, of course feast um, so that this is this is a sign of the hairy footed mite right there okay this right here is the frass that's healthy frass dark stuff that's healthy frass mites pollen mites healthy frass Okay, so when you do open them up, um, check them out, right? We, uh, we had a, a participant who was talking about, you know, well, how do I see about the viability? Okay, if they look like little mummies, little black mummies, okay, that's your chalk brood, totally not viable. If you've got a lot of uh, pollen mite, okay, if it's really bad, like this one is here around this cocoon, not viable. However, um, again, if you are able to take them apart and you are able to um, take your cocoon and your seed out, you can you can clean up your seed, right? You see how there's a little bit of mite here and a little bit of mite here. Um, doesn't seem to be any mite over here. Um, you can clean those up and really watch them and make sure that the mites don't don't attack the cocoons around it. Okay. So that's something to look for. It's a really, it's kind of fun. It's a little, little science, science, sciencey stuff going on here. A little biological science. All right, here is our next poll. So we've got, um, do you have fruit trees or early blooming stuff, pollinator plants? Um, so you have, maybe you've got some stone fruit, maybe you have some palm fruit, uh, blueberry, strawberries, elderberry. Elderberry blooms really early here, which is kind of cool. Um, grape grape flowers. Now, if you've never seen a grape flower, they're itty, 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 tiny. They smell really, really, really good. Um, any early, you know, flowering perennials, okay, going to be really important. Um, I know we've got uh, lots of camellias are a great one, right? They, they, they bloom in that late winter in case we get, have a beautiful early spring, right? So we've got some good stuff. What do you have in your yard? So we um, have almost everybody answered, but I'm gonna leave it up for another second or two. Um, still a couple haven't. Um, and then I will share. Blueberries and strawberries and so on seem to be in the lead. Okay, okay I'm gonna end the poll. And hopefully this is going to show because I'm sharing results. You're not seeing it yet, right? No. Okay, no. I shared the results. They're not showing. Uh, you, the participants, uh, I think, can see it. Um, I just okay. can't see it. I'm on. 
It was okay. <laughs> so if you can't see the, if you're not, if you don't see the shared poll, if you can drop something in the chat saying you're not seeing it, then I'll know when I contact Zoom that I need to. Yep. Something about it. Okay, well, for Jenny's sake, um, we are showing um, about 70%, because this is a multiple choice, about 70% have blueberries, strawberries, elderberries, grapes, et cetera. 50% oh. um, have palm fruit trees, apple, pear, Asian, et cetera. 21% um, have stone fruit, plums, peaches, cherries, and so on. Yeah. And 57% have early flowering perennials. Very good. So we've got some we've got some stuff for them to eat. That's the, that's super important. I'm really glad to hear that um, because the food source is super important. Okay, if you do not have enough food for the mason bees, they're going to go somewhere else. They're going to say goodbye, friends. I'm going where the food is. So um, you you know maybe if you're not seeing enough mason bees or you're not seeing the activity that you wish you had, think about your landscape and think about what you can add to your landscape. It doesn't have to be something that's fruiting per se, but you do have to provide something that is going to have enough pollen um, for them to go out and eat. Okay, um, because they're gonna they're gonna bounce from place to place based on the food that's available. Okay, so if you are seeing a lot of inactivity, think about what you can add to your your landscape um, to to bring in more of those pollinators. Um, and and you can also uh, think about uh, the um, you know if you want to do some potted landscape. Right. Um, think about some, you know, like the echinacea, um, um, you know, different um, calendula. Um, there's so many different uh, things that bloom, um, even Oregon grape and salal. Um, Oregon grape uh, has a beautiful flower um, and they really like that flower. Um, St. John's wort um, has, a, has a lovely yellow flower um, and then that'll produce. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of native plants that flower in early spring that can bring in those mason bees because maybe you have one or two um, things that fruit that you're really looking to eat um, but maybe you just don't have enough um, enough food for them to come in and stay okay or it could be also that um, the mason bees aren't hanging out because maybe you don't have enough early on okay maybe you have things that that flower towards the end of june and that early july that late flowering uh fruit um and that could be that could very well be um because by the time they've they've they're kind of winding down at the end of june and then you're getting those other uh, native pollinators and those honeybees are going full force so so it could be just that you know um the cycle in your landscape uh, might just not be set up for for a mason bee um having that early food because again it's march through june where it's really um, they're the first pollinators out they're ready to go um to do that so so thinking about your landscape is really important and um it may that may be a part of the um the activity level uh, uh in your in your home in your landscape um here are our resources for um city of tacoma the enviro house information okay the the email there is ehouse at cityoftacoma.org um janda volkmer is our coordinator um and her email is there as well uh, we've got garden sphere the address to garden sphere 3310 north proctor um phone number is there as well and it's e the e the uh, website is dot biz uh, garden sphere dot biz uh, not dot com um and then if you want to view any of the Enviro House webinars or how-to videos, okay, they're on uh, the youtube.com back um, slash city of Tacoma. Um, lots of workshops, lots of things there. Um, 
we've done we've done a lot of a lot of good stuff uh, over the last couple of years um, that's available on YouTube. Um, we have winter webinars. They're going to start in February, so look for that in the workshops. Um, Tacoma Tree Coupon, that program. There's the website for that. Uh, Grit City Trees, really cool program. Okay, uh, citytacoma.org. Uh, Landscape Tree Info is on there too with Urban Forestry. Um, the Tacoma Tool Library. Um, if you need a drill maybe to hang that uh, Mason Bee House, um, Tacoma Tool Library is fantastic. Um, and then uh, let's see, we've got some in the chat. Um, let's see. Yeah, all of these are recorded, so they are available to you. Um, cleaning the cocoons cleaning the cocoons so um when you're cleaning your cocoons um i just use like a little paintbrush a really soft soft bristle bristled paintbrush just kind of brush them off um brush off any of the frass um and if you see any mites brushing off the mites just cleaning up a little bit um and um i i have in the past used a glove uh, instead of using my fingers, so the oils from my fingers don't um, transfer to the cocoons. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference, but I feel I just I, I've I've used gloves in the past when I'm when I'm doing it. Um, anything that's really soft to kind of very gently brush off your cocoons, um, it'll it'll work. Um, it'll work just just fine. Um, now, uh, getting up any uh, storing them in the refrigerator, uh, we do store the cocoons um, at Garden Square. We do store all of them in our little mini fridge uh, where we keep our ladybugs and um, all the good stuff in there. Um, and so you can store them in the refrigerator. Um, uh, just keep an eye on them. Um, you know, uh, the moisture level, you do want to maybe keep them in the crisper where it's a little bit more moist um, than in the upper fridge where it might be uh, a little bit more dry. OK, um, if you have like a cool, cool um, and dry garage, um, the humidity in the garage pro probably stays pretty consistent. Um, that will work or a, or a shed of some sort. And what you're doing is you're just trying to keep them nice and cool and consistent, not above uh, somewhere where it's not going to get above 50 degrees um, is, is ideal. Is that ideal? Yeah. Good question. Yeah, really good question. So um, if you have other questions, you can email the Enviro House. I can either get in touch with Jenny or you can check out Garden Sphere and your other local nurseries. Um, do find one that's a good, reliable nursery. The ones that carry tend to carry organic plants and, yeah. and non-toxic um, pesticides and that sort of thing um, are good resources. Um, and then also, Jenny, yeah, I'll do with that. Another question about storage: Does darker light matter? Um, dark is good. Um, if if you have the if you've harvested your cocoons and your mason bee seed, keeping them in a dark a darker space is better rather than a light space because um, you kind of want to mimic that darkness of of uh, the 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 uh, cylindrical housing. Okay. Um, do these bees always look like flies? They are blue orchard mason bees. That yeah, that's what they do yeah. look like. Um, you once you kind of see them up close and personal, you can get a better idea of size. They're not really very big. <laughs> so um, they're, like, they're like big blue flies. And the first time yeah. I had them at the Enviro House was a winter when the plants weren't coming out. As soon as we. Had and I saw these poor little guys flitting around the back sliding door. And <laughs> I thought, Those are huge flies. What are they doing out this early? And then I realized I saw the blue on them. And I realized those were mason bees. And I don't know how they survived, but they apparently did find something to eat because I started out with one of the big block houses. And I think I had 10 cocoons when I started and mm -hmm. I ended up with over half of the tubes filled by the time we got, we probably had 70 cocoons yeah. by the time we got through. Yeah, it was, it was, I remember it being really full and I yeah. do remember when that happened. Yeah. <laughs> that was so then, they got, then they got diseased a couple years later and mm -hmm. I lost them. So I've got to start all over once we get back there. Yeah. But 
anyway, yeah, it's um, they really do. It's a really like fun experience if you see them. But a lot of times they they emerge, they do their thing, and the next thing you know, it's mudded over, and you've uh -huh. never even seen them. Yeah. So, yeah yeah they're solitary little creatures you know they're they do their mating and then they're like okay we are, we're down to business <laughs> we're laying eggs and yeah. not like a, not like the honey honeybees the honeybees you know they they like to be in a family they like to be in a colony yeah mason bees they're right. all about the business <laughs> so i want to remind everybody um to check out the recorded um webinars and the how-to videos jenny has done several of both um, we have some good how-to videos on container gardening and other topics that Jenny's done, herbs and um, you know a lot of the gardening things as long as well as um, the videos. And those are on the city's YouTube channel and they're also on the EnviroHouse website on the workshop page where you would normally register. Um, and then we will be starting, Jenny and I are gonna talk after this about dates. She will be our first presenter in the early late winter, not yet spring. Um, we will probably start with pruning fruit trees again, and we will repeat mason bees, and we will also do one on selecting fruit trees. If you want fruit trees and you don't have them, she will spend um, an hour going over what you need to look for, what grows well in the Pacific Northwest, what will feed your mason bees. Um, so we will start those after the first of the year, and those will be on the EnviroHouse website um, for registration. And um, also, if you are not familiar with the Tacoma Tree Coupon, um, that particular one, I believe you have to be a resident. I can't remember now, I'm getting all my tree programs mixed up, but I think you have to be a resident of Tacoma. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe a Tacoma Park customer to, to use the tree coupon program. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is the Grit City tree program. Um, I think the Grit City is the one that's the more specific. Um, both of those I think are still going on. Um, so if you wanna check out the tree coupons, um, check the website that, I, that is in the video and I put it in the chat. Um, it's Grit City Trees is um, cityoftacoma.org slash trees, I think, and that's not showing on there. Um, and then the landscape one, the urban forestry, that has uh, a lot of information on it as well. So do check those out because you can get up to $30 off on the tree coupon. You can get up to $30 off on three trees if you are interested in that. It's a really good deal. It's a really yeah. good deal. And Garden Sphere is one of the suppliers. Um, you have to buy for one of six or seven or so mm -hmm. um, specific nurseries that have signed on to the program, but Garden Sphere is one of those yeah. suppliers. So thank you all for coming. It's been a good season, and this is our last webinar for this year. So hopefully, we will see you all in the spring. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.